I wrote my first cookbook in 1971. Um, I was in my early 20s. And it got published not because it was the world's greatest cookbook, but because at the time there were almost no young people who were interested in food. And the publishers were fascinated by this strange creature who came in at 20 and said, you know, I want to write a cookbook. Um, right after the book came out, I moved to Berkeley and became part of a restaurant collective. I had no formal training, and neither did any of the people that I started this restaurant with. We were not professional, but we were a group of people who had the idea that cooking was honest work and that it was important. And we believed in making everything from scratch, which was at the time a really radical idea. I mean, this is a time when people would come in, look up at, at our menu and say, what's a cliche? <laughs> um, I mean, literally nobody had ever, I mean, they'd never heard of quiche, they didn't know how to pronounce it. Um, and we made salads that were made with fresh vegetables, no iceberg, and our salad dressings were made with vinegar and olive oil, and that in 1972 was a very strange thing for um, an American restaurant. Um, I mean, at that time, good food in a restaurant invariably meant that it was French, unless it was continental. And a time when the best chef in California said, on the record, California is a beautiful country, but when it comes to ingredients, forget it. This was a time when there was not a single American-made goat cheese, no decent bread anywhere in the country, and sushi was such a foreign idea that if you had told any sort of real American that they would soon be eating raw fish, they would have sent you to an insane asylum. There were no farmer's markets, and if you wanted to eat humanely raised animals, well, good luck in finding them. More importantly, the public was utterly ignorant of the fact that the food that they were eating was different than the food that their parents had eaten. They didn't know that their food was being rapidly industrialized. They didn't know that uh, farms had become factories. And they certainly didn't know that fertilizers were to be feared. They didn't know that we were about to chase most of the big fish in the ocean to extinction. Nobody had ever heard of CAFOs. And they were blithely unaware of how flavorless their food had become. And above all, Nobody at the time realized that we were subjecting an entire generation to an enormous experiment in eating that was going to have dire consequences in the years to come. And I'm here to tell you that if it changed, and that did change, it was the chefs who changed it. And let me give you a few flashbacks, a few moments that I remember most along the way. We're in the late 70s now, and I'm in Santa Monica doing a piece about the opening of a restaurant that seemed so strange to my editors that they sent me to spend almost a year doing a piece about the opening of this restaurant. Uh, Michael McCarty has never gotten the kind of credit he deserves for being in the forefront of the American food revolution. And I suspect that's because he was in Los Angeles, which was um, on nobody's radar at the time as a food place. But he was 25 years old. And all the chefs that he hired were younger than he was. You know, Ken Frank, Mark Peel, Jonathan Waxman, Nancy Silverton. But most importantly, they were all American and they were all educated. Today, that doesn't seem like anything. But in the 70s, real chefs were still French, almost universally. And the idea of an ambitious restaurant being staffed by Americans was radical. Even more radical was the idea of using American products. Um, and certainly, the idea of having an American wine list just seemed crazy. But as Michael said at the time, we want to do the wildest things. We want to blow your socks off. And he introduced his clientele to an entirely new notion of what restaurant dining could be. It was very simple. It was based on good ingredients that were left pretty much to speak for themselves. In those days, it was called California cuisine, 
and it required one thing, great local products. It was because of that, because people would go to restaurants like Chez Panisse and taste something that they remembered what flavor, flavor could be. And then, you know, they started wanting those. And that's how farmers markets started. I mean, I remember one very specific example of this. I was at Larry Forgione's, an American place in New York. And the people at the next table were eating sh strawberry shortcake. And the biscuits were placed on the table in front of them and a huge bowl of strawberries. And then Larry came into the dining room shaking cream in a mason jar. And, he, and by the time he got to the table, the cream had been whipped and he poured it onto their plates. And this woman's, I mean, I was watching her and her mouth literally dropped open. And she said to her husband, she said to Larry, what do you have in the jar? Do you have something magic in there that makes it whip? And he looked at her and he said, no, if you get really good cream, all you have to do is shake it a little and it whips. And when he left the table, she, you know, put some on a spoon and handed it to her husband and said, you know, we have to be able to get cream this good at home. Um, and I want to reiterate what Tom said, which is that um, in those days, American food was not so great. You would go to Paris and revel in what you were eating. The, the food was so wonderful. And we do not understand what has happened in this country. We still are very shy about being proud of our artisans. But American food, I now think, is the best food in the world. We have artisans and farmers and people who are making jam and bakers. And um, these artisans are making food that is so much better than what you can get in Europe these days um, that it is stunning. And we need to really be proud of this fact that while the Europeans, and I think it's partly because of the EU rules, which have sort of created a kind of homogenization, that while they've given up their patrimony, we have reclaimed it. And um, we eat, we can, if we're rich enough, eat really well. And one of the things that we all have to do is make sure that this is not a class issue, that good food um, is something that everybody can have access to. You'd have to be deaf not to know that hunger stalks half the world while the other half is eating itself to death. And you'd have to be blind not to know about the horrors of CAFOs and what the, food, the fast food chains are doing to children. And you'd have to be both not to know that climate change is wreaking havoc on the international food supply. And yet, despite media attention and the efforts of people like Jamie Oliver and Michael Pollan, the American public still has so much to learn about sustainability that it sometimes shocks me. Well, here's an example of that. Um, thanks to farmers markets, there aren't many educated Americans who don't know that food has seasons and um, there are very few consumers who could go out in New England and buy strawberries in February and think that they were local. Um, and yet, I think most Americans still don't really understand that living sustainably means you can't have everything whenever you want it. Um, I, I've invested in a butcher shop in the Berkshires that sells only meat from, that's been humanely raised by local farmers. Um, and just after Memorial Day, I was in the shop one day when a woman came in looking for lamb chops. And um, the butcher said to her, we don't have any. Um, we, sold, we sold a lot of lamb over the holiday. And she said, well, can I come in next week and get, get some? And he said, no, we won't have any lamb till the fall. And this woman looked at him and she said, you expect me to wait four months until I can eat lamb again? And you know, the butcher said, well, you know, it takes a long time to raise lamb, and the farmer doesn't have any more. And I watched that register on this woman's face. And I think despite the fact that she was buying local meat at a local shop at ruinous prices, this is the first time that she really understood that sustainability was about the fact 
that being sustainable means being on nature's schedule, not on yours. Um, and we still have so much to learn. Um, you know, we began as an, uh, a nation of farmers, and today only 2% of the population has ever even visited a farm. Um, our relationship to nature is still both distant and uncomfortable. And chefs are, in so many ways, the guardians of the gate, the first place that many people in the public learn about the sustainability of our food. We in the media can talk about it, but chefs are the ones who can taste it. And Tom is right, you know, it's the one thing, you cannot have a virtual restaurant. And people can go and taste what food is, what real food tastes like. They can learn about eating with the seasons. And there are so many new lessons to be learned. Um, we're still, all of us, living incredibly high on the hog, gobbling up so many more of the, real, of the world's resources than is our fair share. And chefs are the ones who can help change that. I think one of the most important lessons that restaurants have taught people is a, a different way of defining luxury. When I began, writing about restaurants, everybody in America knew what a great, luxurious restaurant was. It was a place that had gorgeous table settings, acres of flowers, soft music, ponderous wine lists. When you opened a menu in a luxury restaurant, you invariably found foie gras, lobster, caviar, and champagne. But chefs have taught the public an entirely new definition of luxury. And it's remarkable to me to hear people talking about, you know, what their idea of luxury being a place that grows its own produce, um, that presses its own olive oil, that maybe even makes its own wine. Um, it's a, remarkable to talk about people as luxury being the idea of eating food that doesn't make you feel guilty. Um, that is a stunning change. Um, and it's gone from the restaurants right into the heart of the American home. And it offers us an incredible opportunity. Um, I had, an, just to bring this back to Top Chef Masters, yesterday at the airport, I had a really extraordinary experience. I was standing in one of those endless lines to go through security. I mean, it was, and you know, we, we wove back and forth and we were all sort of get to this point where we would see the people next to us and then the line would move on. And this woman, woman kept staring at me and then the line would move on and then it'd come around again and she'd stare at me. And about the fourth time that we <laughs> were together, um, she said to me, um, I have to tell you this. She said, I just watched the finale of Top Chef Masters, and um, I watched your face as you were eating that tripe, and I have never wanted to eat tripe, but <laughs> you looked like you really liked it. And she said, and, and last night I was in a restaurant, and I ordered tripe for the first time in my life. And I thought, you know, I mean, when I started doing Top Chef Masters, uh, my agent said, you know, why do you want to do this silly reality TV show? And in this one moment, I thought, you know, this is why you do that. This is because we all talk about nose to tail eating. We can talk about it till the cows come home unless we can make people understand that they want to eat tripe, they want to eat blood sausage, they want to eat heart, they want to eat liver. Um, nose to tail, it's just a word. but. Uh, if chefs can go on TV and make Americans think that tripe is delicious, which it is, um, that is that is a wonderful thing. You know, we, we have all heard endlessly about the new celebrity of chefs, and we see it get demonstrated over and over and over again. When I began my career as a restaurant critic, being a chef was still a blue-collar job. It was done 
almost exclusively by uneducated men, and in those days it was men. Um, and um, they went to work in restaurants when they were still teenagers and worked their way up. And I, I saw you know, Robert Del Grande uh, this morning, and I remember that in the first years when anybody wrote about his restaurant, everybody put into it that he had a PhD because it was the idea of somebody with a PhD wanting to be a chef was such a radical idea. Um, the people who worked in restaurants basically were working for modest salaries and no fame. Patrons might know the name of the restaurateur, but they almost never knew the name of the person at the stove. Well, that's certainly changed. I mean, today's chefs are highly educated men and women who are charismatic and articulate and leaders. And they can hope, if they're talented and very lucky, to be very famous and very rich. But I would argue that with that change has come a real responsibility. Restaurants today are different than they once were. They're not just businesses anymore. If the landscape has changed for the patrons, it's changed for the chefs too. You can all go out there and make great names for yourselves because restaurants are no longer just places to eat and chefs aren't just the people manning the stoves. Restaurants have become cultural institutions and chefs have become cultural icons. And if chefs want all the new perks that come with being a chef, then they have to accept the responsibility as well. Yes, you can become rich and famous, but while you're doing that, you can also change the world. <laughs>